We serve a great God, amen? Let's all sing together. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. And great are you. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Girl, great are you lord You bring light to the darkness. Thank you, Lord. You give hope. You restore. You restore. tonight. Let's sing that one more time. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Lord Jesus,
Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. We thank you for your spirit that is among us tonight. Lord, we love you, and we cannot praise you enough. Lord, just because you have given us life today, just because you have put air in our lungs, Lord, that's reason enough to praise you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives, all that you're doing. Lord, we thank you tonight that you are a faithful God, that you hear us when we cry out to you and you answer our prayers. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How are y'all doing tonight? Y'all doing good? Doing well, I should say. Had a good day? I tell you, if you can't tell, we're getting ready for Christmas. We are getting ready for Christmas. It's coming this Sunday. How many of you are going to be here Sunday at 5 o'clock? Okay, if you don't have your hand up, you need to get that hand up and make your way to here to this place on Sunday because you are going to, if you're not here, you're going to miss it. I'm telling you, there's some, so many exciting things that are happening. I'm so blessed tonight to have Austin Perkins here with us from all the way from Mississippi. He's one of our singers that are going to be singing with us this weekend. And you all know this lady right here to my left. This is Rachel Smith back from Florida. And uh, we're just excited to have her with us as well. Let's continue to worship the Lord tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. Amen. Yes.
What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ My King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, we praise the name. We praise the name of Jesus. We just put our hands together tonight and give God praise. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We bless you. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. Come on, Austin, lead us, brother. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing yes. of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am made of, oh I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'll surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Sing it out all my life. In all my life you have been faithful. Amen. Has he been faithful to you tonight? In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I have made. Oh, I'm going to see of the goodness of God. See 
Hallelujah. Let's praise him tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You can go ahead. You can be seated. Well, church, can you say amen? amen? I've been really giving Brother Allen a hard time this week about uh, all of the decorations and everything, and um, I want you to know that we still love each other and we still get along. Amen? I'm excited about this uh, weekend. It's going to be good. Amen? Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John and go with me to chapter number 6, if you will, the Gospel of John in chapter number 6 tonight. And uh, it seems like it's been a couple of months since we've been together on Wednesday. It's only been a couple of weeks. I want to thank you for a couple of weeks ago uh, being here for our packing party and for helping. And, man, what a blessing that was. Amen? To be able to come together and put those boxes together and pray over them and get them sent off. And so thank you for all of your help. And then our Thanksgiving banquet and then on Thanksgiving Day for all of you that uh, volunteered and gave of your time of your money to come and to help and to be a blessing to so many. It was a great, great blessing. Then this past Sunday, the lighting of the Christmas tree, I mean, just a lot of stuff was accomplished in two weeks. And thanks to you for your help and for all that you have done, all that you're doing. And uh, we just look forward to finishing the year strong. Amen? Amen. And so don't forget uh, this Sunday, as Brother Allen mentioned, 5 o'clock. If you get here at 6.30, we'll still be here, but you will miss it. So make sure you're here at 5 o'clock on uh, Sunday, and then come prepared to stay after. We're going to the banquet hall, and uh, we have hot chocolate, we have cider, we have cookies, we have all kind of goodies, and it's just going to be a good time of fellowship following uh, the, the service as we worship the Lord on this Sunday. And then, I don't know if you know it or not, but Christmas Eve is right around the corner, and uh, I need everyone tonight to get them a stack of the Christmas Eve invite cards and take those and begin to invite. I was reading again today, of people that come to church, 86% come to church because someone invited them to come. Uh, Not because the pastor invited them, not because of advertisement, but because someone invited them. And we're giving you a lot of opportunities to invite people. Amen. We're giving you a lot of good excuses to reach out and invite people. And so on Christmas Eve, uh, we're going to have two um, uh, identical services, 1030 in the morning, 5 o'clock. If you want to come to both, feel free to do so. Uh, Candlelight Christmas Eve service. It's going to be a great, great day, and we look forward to that. John 6, verse number 1. And uh, we're going, we've been looking at the Gospel of John, uh, just working through some of the miracles, and uh, this now is the next one, and I want to speak about it, talk about it for a little while tonight. John chapter 6. Who's glad they came to church? Hey, one more thing, while we're making announcements, while I've got your attention, while I have a captive audience. Uh, Many of you have read through the Bible with us the past couple of years. We've done it together as a church. It's been a great journey, amen? Amen. And one of the great blessings in my life as pastor has been numerous people who have told me, I've never read the Bible all the way through until you've challenged us to do it. And it has been just so rewarding for me to hear many, and I don't mean just 10 or 20 or 30 people, I mean many people have told me that uh, through the past couple of years. And so if you have uh, just recently uh, joined us at MIMS, uh, you can go in our foyer and pick up the Bible that we use. It's the Everyday with Jesus Bible. Uh, It doesn't mean that you can't read the Bible through in a year if you don't read that Bible. It just means it has it all laid out for you every day, what to read, a portion of the Old Testament uh, from Proverb, from Psalm, and then a portion of the New Testament and a daily devotion. I love the devotions. I've used it since 2005, and uh, several hundred of our people have used it every year to read through, and we just go through it together. And uh, we encourage each other when we get to Leviticus. Can I get an amen? Amen? Uh, Do you know the majority of the people who start in January and say, I'm going to read the Bible through, the majority stop uh, when they get to Leviticus. It's sort of like the gym membership. It's all good for about the month of January. Then you get to Leviticus, and you start reading about all of these Canaanites and Hittites and termites and every other kind of ites, and you just, yes or no? And so the good thing about it is if you'll do it with us, we're, we're helping each other and we're encouraging each other and uh, we'll get through it together. And so you can pick up those in the foyer and uh, they'd be a blessing to you. The Everyday with Jesus Bible, they are $20 a piece 
And if for some reason you can't afford that, we'll make it work for you. But we don't want that to stand in your way. It's just to recoup what we paid to get them here and the shipping. So pick you up one and go through it uh, with us together as we get ready for the new year to read it through. John chapter 6, verse number 1. John chapter 6, verse number 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Let me stop there for just a minute because we talked about this just the other day again. Anytime you see the Lord asking a question in Scripture, you stop and you automatically know enough to know. He is not asking that question because he needs the answer. Who in the room understands that? Jesus already knew the answer. Jesus asked the question for their benefit. So the Bible says, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? This he said, verse 6, to test him, to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad. He's here. He has five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the people to sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and to the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain that there, so that there is nothing lost. Therefore they gathered them up, and they filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. The feeding of the 5,000, you just can never get enough of it. Amen? What an amazing, amazing miracle. 38 recorded miracles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And certainly we know from reading the end of the Gospel of John that those were not all of the miracles that Jesus performed while here on the earth. As a matter of fact, in the concluding verses of the Gospel of John, it tells us that these signs were not all of the signs that our Lord performed, but these signs were recorded in order that you may believe that he is the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. In other words, John selected for us these seven signs. Sign means a miracle with a message. It is a sermon behind the miracle. Certainly, we look at the feeding of the 5,000, but John goes a little deeper in this lengthy chapter, John 6, to explain to us and to give to us a discourse of exactly what's going on and exactly what is taking place in this sermon. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. There are other miracles that are duplicated in other Gospels, but this miracle is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And as I just said, John goes deeper and goes beneath the surface to give us the root and to give us exactly the sermon and the message behind this miracle. That's why it's called a sign. Now, the liberal theologians do not take this literally. The liberal theologians, here's how they interpret it, and I mean this sincerely. The liberal authors, the liberal theologians will take this text and here's what they say. They say Jesus did not actually take this boy's lunch and multiply it and feed a multitude, but rather this is what they say happened. They say that Jesus was teaching them and they were so overwhelmed by his good teaching and they were so moved upon by all that he said that they were so filled with his words that they forgot all about their hunger and they left satisfied because of the teaching of Jesus Christ. Well, there's a good word for that. It's called hogwash. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Good, night of mighty. You get into trouble when you put a question mark where God puts a period, yes or no. 
You say, preacher, I just do not understand how Jesus could take a little boy's lunch, multiply it, and feed 5,000 men, not to mention their wives, not to mention their children. It could have been upward of 15, maybe 20,000 or even more people. I don't understand how Jesus could take a little boy's lunch and multiply it and feed a hungry multitude. But if you can believe in your heart, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, then you can believe God can do with his creation whatever he chooses to do with his creation. Amen? It is so important, it is so vital for us to get that straight and to understand it. There are many lessons that we could learn from this miracle. Certainly we could learn that Jesus cares about the physical needs of people, and indeed he does. But it is not just a social gospel that we're learning tonight. It is not just making the world a better place gospel that we're learning this evening. Jesus is trying to teach us something that is much deeper and even more significant than merely that which is on the surface. Does he care about the needs of humanity? Indeed he does. Does he care about those who are hungry? Of course he does. Does he commission us to go and to look after those who are in need? Yes, he does. But there is something much more crucial that the Lord is trying to get us to understand in this message tonight, and I pray we'll listen to it. First of all, I want to call your attention to the hurting crowd. Notice the hurting crowd. Verse 1, after these things, what things? The healing of the lame man that we read about in chapter 5 a couple of weeks ago. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, and a great multitude followed him because they saw that his signs, the signs that he performed on those who were diseased. In other words, they had needs. Certainly, it was their needs that drew them to the Lord. Now, were their motives all pure? No, they were not. Were they there to get something from Jesus? Yes, they were. Does that outrage the Pharisees? Absolutely. Does it sometimes upset us in the room tonight? Yes, it does. But if all of us would get honest before God, and if all of us would tell the truth in our heart, there had been many times in our lives where we have sought the Lord with impure motives. There had been many times in our life when we have prayed to God for him to work miracles, not for his glory, but for our own benefit. Amen? God heal me, and he is a healing God. But what is often the motive behind us asking God to heal us? certainly to remove pain, certainly for our comfort. And I'm here to tell you I'm the first one that prays for that, so don't look at me like I'm crazy. But I'm telling you tonight, there are many times that we follow the Lord and we worship the Lord and we praise the Lord with, with, with ill intentions. We do it not from a pure heart. We do it not from a pure motive. And certainly that was the case in this crowd. And I've got good news to report to everyone in the house. God still met their need even though he knew their motives were anything but pure. Who can say amen to that? I cannot tell you the times God has answered my prayer only for me to look back over and to discover that my motive was anything but pure. Jesus, we're told, verse 3, went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and it was the Passover, a feast of the Jews that was drawing near. Now notice the motives of this crowd that we just got through talking about. Thousands of people are gathering around Jesus. They're observing him. And as they are in caravan traveling, Luke tells us they're on their way to go where? To Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus is there going to die on a cross. And all of this crowd is getting in the crowd with him and they're following with him. And there are certainly a mixed multitude. There's the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees. There were those that were there with pure hearts and those that were there with impure heart and with impure motive. And they're following the Lord. Why? Because they're curious. They see that he's healing others of their diseases, and certainly they have needs as well. And certainly they think to themselves, perhaps if he could do that for them, what could he do for me? And they're traveling with him, and they're following him. Certainly, if you study the Bible, you know there were other reasons they were in the crowd and following him. Uh, You know that they wanted a military conqueror. They wanted a deliverer. They wanted someone that would deliver them from the control of the Roman Empire. It probably was the reason Judas wanted to be the treasurer, the keeper of the bag. Because in his own heart, he knew, certainly, watch this, that there had to be a lot of money to be had if you'd overthrow the Roman Empire, right? And so Judas perhaps thought, boy, if I could be his right-hand man and his treasurer and the keeper of the bag, I can line my own pockets. And so here is this crowd with a mixed motive, with mixed hearts and with, with impure motives following the Lord, seeking him. But notice the mercy of God. You see, when you study this and you put it together, you will discover they're tired, they're weary, they had been gone all day long, and now, watch this, it's almost evening time, and they're hungry, and they have absolutely nothing to eat. 
And I am so thankful to know, and I need to remind myself of this truth, that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Amen? I grew up hearing, what about you? God only helps those who help themselves. Who's heard that before? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've been guilty of saying it, but I dare think all of us have probably thought it. And we say such things as they made their bed, now let them lie in it. Have you ever, you know, I am often reminded of this fact. God, thank you that you're God and I'm not. Amen? I mean, let's just use me as an example since I'm up here preaching. You folk better get on your knee and thank God I'm not God. Amen? Because I'd have a zapper. Can I get a witness? And I'd just start zapping people, yes or no. Give them a good shock. Can anyone say amen tonight? And I know some of you, well, I know almost all of you, and some of you too well, amen? And I'm thankful to the Lord you're not God. Amen? I know how some of you treat your husband and how some of you treat your wife, and my goodness, I wouldn't want to get on your bad side if you were God. You say, well, I'll tell you, preacher, God only helps those who help themselves. Where'd you get that? You didn't get it from the Bible. You see, they that are whole don't need a physician. God didn't come to help those, watch this, who have got it all together. He came to help those who don't have it all together. God has big shoulders. And you're exactly right. We ought to seek the Lord with pure motives. Absolutely, we should. And on this side of the cross, we ought to pursue him with the purest of hearts and the purest of intentions. Amen? You know, even as a preacher, I've got to constantly watch my heart, constantly preach to myself. God, pack our church out and save people for the glory of God. And that's a good prayer to pray. But I've got to always guard my motives and make sure there's no ill intention there. Amen? Are you listening? I'm learning in my life it's best when God moves, just shut your mouth, not talk about it. Because the more we talk about it, the more we get in the way and mess it up. And the more we talk about it, the more we try to figure it all out. And the more we try to figure it all out, the more we try to take credit for it. And if you're not careful, what starts happening is when God moves, we get to thinking that it's we're doing something right. We're singing the right songs, wearing the right clothes, saying amen at the right time, preaching the right sermons, getting out of the bed at the right time. And before you know it, it's all about me, 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 and not him, 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 him. And God is a jealous God, and he will share his glory with no one. So you're exactly right. We should pursue him with a pure heart. We should worship him with pure motives. Absolutely. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm just here to report to you some good news. Even though Jesus knew what was in their heart, and even though he knew what they were after, he still told them to sit down. I'm still going to feed you, and I'm still going to meet your needs. Now, before you get too excited about all of that, when he was done, he preached the truth to them. And through preaching the truth, every one of them got up and left. They all wanted him when he was feeding their bellies. Can I get a witness from anyone? Amen? Hey, if you're going to shout when it's good stuff, you need to say amen when we get down to the tough stuff. Yes or no? So they all wanted him when he was feeding their bellies. But as soon as he turned to them and he began to talk to them about denying their self, one by one, they all got up and left. And it's when Jesus turned to the disciples and said, are you going to leave me as well? And they turned to him and said, where are we to go? You're the one with the words of eternal life. And so what do we learn about the hurting crowd? Their motives were certainly anything but pure and right. But yet the mercy of God tells us crystal clear, watch this, that God will meet the needs of people and the hurting multitude even when their motives are not right. There are some people I meet and good night, they need help, but they don't even really know what they need. They need comfort, they need relief, they need ease, they want it to stop. They're going through heartaches, they're going through hard times, but they don't even understand the spiritual condition that is beneath the surface and that is going on behind all of that. And you see, if we're not careful, all we'll do is put Band-Aids on problems, and yet the root is still there, and we need the Lord to get us down to the root to really change who we are. The hurting crowd. Who in the room would confess we're a hurting crowd? Amen? But secondly, I want you to notice the hungry crowd. The hungry crowd. Now... If I could just make a joke, I could certainly relate to the hungry crowd. Can I get a witness? Amen? Don't ever ask me, preacher, are you hungry? Because I promise you the answer is always yes. Preacher, do you want to eat? The answer is yes. Amen. And if I ever tell you no, it's a lie. So there you go. But I want you to notice the hungry crowd. Now now look at verse 5. Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he sees a great multitude. He sees them. No one else sees them, but he sees them. 
You, you need to stop when you see that in the New Testament. I mean, I, I've never really gone through and studied how many times it says that. But have you noticed how many times in the Gospels it says that Jesus saw them? I mean, Jesus is a God. And that word means to behold, to gaze intently upon, to look intently upon. Jesus, I mean, he didn't just casually. He saw them like no other. And aren't you thankful God sees us that way? Amen. When no one else sees what you're going through, when no one else sees what's going on in your life, he sees. You say, preacher, I'm all alone tonight. No, you're not all alone. God knows everything there is to know about you. He sees you, yes or no. Quit giving Santa Claus that much credit. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Can I get some help from anyone in the room? Hey, you don't want me to talk about Santa Claus tonight, do you? No, no, don't talk about Santa Claus. But I'm telling you, God sees everything there is. And he looks intently into our heart, into our soul, into our being, and he knows everything there is to know. And the Bible tells us, verse 5, that he sees this multitude coming toward him, and he says to Philip, where are we going to buy bread that these may eat? Now, he said this, the Bible says, to test Philip. Philip had to be the mathematician in the crowd. He had to be the math genius in the crowd. And so Philip begins to try to reason it out, and Philip begins to try to figure it all out. Now, notice when we study the hungry crowd, the situation. Now, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Mark concerning this story that it was about evening time, and certainly there was no food. They did not prepare to eat. They were gone all day. It had been a busy day. They had been ministering. And so Jesus turns to Philip, and he asks this question, what are we to do? And Philip answers, and he says, well, 200 denarii worth of bread, it's not sufficient for them. In other words, it comes up short. It's lacking so that every one of them could have a little so in other words, what they're doing is they're beginning to look for all of the different suggestions and they're trying to figure it out. Mark's gospel tells us that the disciples get together and guess what their solution was? Their solution was send them all away. Send them home. Let's dismiss the service. Sorry, guys, we have nothing to feed you. Let's all go. In other words, don't worry about them. That was their solution. That was their suggestion. Bury your head in the sand. Ignore it. Act like it's not there. Sing a little louder. Preach a little longer. No one will notice it, perhaps. But Philip is asked, what are we going to do? And he's asked this question to be put to the test, verse 6, to prove him, the Bible says. He's not asking for information. He's asking this question because he wants to teach Philip a lesson. Amen? Amen. You know, it's like an algebra teacher. When they ask you a question, they already know the answer, yes or no. Someone has said a faith that's never been tested will never be able to be trusted and God will put us to the test. Watch this so that we can grow. So Philip, he proposes the next solution. Mark's gospel, the solution was send them home. Philip's solution is, well, let's, let's look at what we got. And so they pull their resources and he concludes, well, we've got 200 penny worth or denarii. Uh, that's a day's wage. So in other words, we've got 200 days wages. Now let me just go through this very quickly. A laborer with a family of five would spend half of his income on food. So let's just assume for a moment that a family would eat three meals a day. Half of a denarii would have furnished 15 meals. One denarii would have furnished three, 30 meals. 200 would have provided one meal for 6,000 people. They've got about 20,000 people. And what, what he's saying is, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. We, we're, we're real short. We're insufficient. There's absolutely no way, watch this, for us to provide enough for all of them to eat. Why? Because he looked at what he had in his hand. He looked at what was in his pocket. He looked at what was in his bank account. And who in the, boy, good night, man, that'll make a preacher preach right there. Amen? Who in the room would testify that's exactly what we do when faced with problems? We sit down, get out the calculator, yes or no? And God help us to never do it in the church. And you better just go ahead and say amen right there. God help us to stop that foolishness in the church. Because the issue is not, do we have enough? The issue is, what's God saying? Because if you find out what God's saying and do what God's saying, I don't know if you know this or not, let me just remind you of a few little truths. Where he guides, he provides. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he directs, he protects. Amen? So they pull their resources and they look and they're like, good night, we don't have enough money. I mean, at best, we only have enough money to feed folks 6,000 people for one meal. There's at least 20,000 people. We're in trouble, Right? We can't even give them a crumb. Why? Because when our eyes are on, watch this, on our resources, instead of Jesus, we're always going to come up shy. We're always going to come up short. 
Well, here comes Andrew. You know, Mark's, that Mark's gospel says, send them away. Philip says, well, we don't have enough. So he really didn't provide a solution, did he? He just said, well, we just don't have enough. Philip uh, is, he had to have been a Baptist. <laughs> Amen? I've been a Baptist all my life. And if you're not a Baptist, you know, don't take offense to that. I've just been a Baptist all my life. And uh, I can't tell you how many Baptists I've heard make this statement. I've heard it hundreds of times. You ready? Where are we going to get the money? And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I learned this a long time ago. You ready? Anytime someone asks, where are we going to get the money? You can go ahead and write it down, not from them. Amen. Amen. Philip made several mistakes. What were they? Thinking that money was the solution to the problem. Second mistake he made was calculating without Jesus. In other words, his eyes were on his, what he had, his worth, his belongings, his stuff. Then Andrew comes in, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, said to him, Well, there's a lad here. He has five barley loaves, two small fish. What are they among so many? In other words... Here he is, he points out this little boy, this lad, and he goes, well, he's got a little lunch. But what are these among so many? It seems so small, it seems so insignificant. Why should I even, why should I even bring it up? Five little barley loaves, the food that the poor would eat. Fish, probably more like sardines. Yuck, can I get a witness? Now, buddy, you got a problem here, yes or no? Amen? Now, I don't mean to make anyone mad, but, you know, there, there's enough to go around for everyone. The name it, claim it crowd would have said, don't admit you got a problem. Deny it. The other extreme would have said, send them away. Where are we going to get the money? Faith says, God, we don't have the wherewithal to do this, but we're going to trust you. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, you're always good when you just get balanced. And don't allow folks to pull you to this direction or that direction. Right? Send them away. That wasn't the answer. We don't have enough money. We can't do this. We can't feed them. That's not the answer. And so Andrew says, well, here's a little boy, and he's got a lunch. It's not much. What are these among so many? And notice the solution, verse 10. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Let me ask you a question. What do you think went through the minds of the disciples when Jesus said, make the people to sit down? We're about to get laughed out of town. Amen? Hey, folks, listen. We didn't have 5,000 men, and we didn't have 20,000 people. But a couple of weeks ago, we had a good number of folks show up to eat Thanksgiving. And I know how much food we put away. Amen? And I'm telling you, five little loaves wouldn't have done it for us. And they've got thousands. And Jesus says, tell them to sit down. So they start sitting down. You know, tell them to sit down. What do you think the people were thinking? Where's the food? Where's the groceries? Amen? I mean, there's not a Walmart nearby. Yes or no? We can't just put it in our cart Say we're going to swing by and pick it up and then put it in the back of the car. We don't have any groceries. How are we going to feed these people? And so they just start telling them, sit down. And my goodness, which blo what blows my mind even more than that, they start, they start taking their seats. They start doing it. Now, they were following Jesus because they watched him work miracles. I don't know what they were thinking, but perhaps they thought, okay, we don't know what's about to happen, but, man, we're going to watch the show. And so they sit down. The Bible says the places where they're sitting are in the grassy areas, so it must have been springtime, which goes along with the Passover. And so here is the solution. Tell the people to sit down. Now, thirdly, I want you to notice, watch this, the hurting crowd, the hungry crowd. Thirdly, look at this, the happy crowd. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think they went from hungry to happy just like that, yes or no? Amen? Now, notice verse 11. 
And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. Do you notice what Jesus did? He gave thanks. Now, I'm not going to preach you a sermon on what you ought to pray before you eat. You do what you want to do, and you follow whatever it is that you want to follow. But have you ever listened to the way that we pray before we eat? Yes or no? Lord, bless this to the nourishment of my body. If you'd open your eyes and look what's on that plate, you probably ought to hush your mouth, the nourishment of my body. You got a honey bun and a Diet Coke, and you're asking God to bless it to the nourishment of your body. Amen? Yes or no? I believe it is a good practice before you eat, even if you're by yourself, to just simply bow your head and thank the Lord for what he's given you. And the whole point of praying before you eat is not for the Lord to bless what you're eating. The reason to bow your head and to pray is to say the following. Are you ready? God, I have enough sense to know if it weren't for your grace, I'd be eating out of a dumpster somewhere today. I'd be digging through garbage cans looking for bones and stuff to eat and fill my stomach. I'd be starving. But because of your grace and because of your goodness, I have something to eat. Thank you for it. Hallelujah to your name. Amen? I'm not trying to be silly, but I just think it's a good practice for us always to get into the habit of bowing our head and thanking the Lord and remembering when we're praying what we're doing, we're thanking him because every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and it comes down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, the book of James says. So that means everything I have has been given to me by him. I have food to eat because he's a good God, amen? I have something to drink because he's a good God. I have a bed to lie down in because he's a good God. Yes or no? Oh, let me be clear. He'd be good if I didn't have a bed to lie down. But I'm just thanking him for what he's providing for me. Amen? Hmm. And so the Bible says, watch this, verse 11, that Jesus takes the loaves and he gives thanks and he distributes it to the disciples. And the disciples begin to distribute it to those that are sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they want. Now, you know, you can go back and study this, and you could come to whatever conclusion you want. Uh, most Bible scholars will tell you they're convinced that, watch this, it started multiplying as they started passing it out. And I think there's probably some good indication to that. I'm not going to make some doctrine on that. You know, you say, we'll ask the Lord when we get to heaven, or you know what, when we get to heaven, we probably all already know, or maybe there'll be a lot of other things we care about more. Amen? But anyway, he takes the loaves, he gives thanks, he gives it to the disciples. Watch this. And then the disciples, he uses them to go and distribute it. Incidentally, that's what he does even today. He gives us the gospel and he says, now you go and distribute it. And as you go and distribute it, it'll be multiplied. Amen? So the Bible says, watch this, they were sitting down and they ate as much as they wanted. I like that. I said, I like that. Amen. Is there a man in the house could help me, please? Can any man help me right now and say amen? amen. I've eaten with some of you guys. And when, if you eat what you want and I eat what I want, that's a lot. Amen. And so they ate as much as they wanted. And the Bible says, verse 12, when they were filled, my goodness, it was a supernatural miracle. But not only was it a supernatural miracle, it was a substantial miracle because watch this. Not only did they eat all they needed, they got all they wanted, and they were satisfied. My goodness gracious. He gave it to the disciples. The disciples passed it out. They were filled. He said to his disciples, now gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. It was a substantial miracle. Therefore, they gathered them up. They filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. My goodness gracious. The Lord provided a miracle, but it was a substantial miracle. Not only did they eat, they ate all they wanted. They ate till they were filled. And then he said, gather it all up. And there was 12 baskets that remained. Who's thankful for that? That's how our God works. Yes or no? Can anyone testify that was a substantial miracle and a supernatural miracle? Yes or no? Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus said, you go and you gather it all up. Don't waste anything. That's what he tells us with the gospel. Listen, don't you dare waste it. God blesses it. He puts it in our hands. You go distribute it. As we go distribute it, it is multiplied. As it's multiplied, people are satisfied. It meets their needs. But you make sure that nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Don't you even waste one single solitary fragment. 
Now, oh my goodness, I've got to do it. And uh, y'all know me, and I'm a glutton for punishment, and I just, I've got to do it. I've got to before we go. Amen? Is everyone still awake? Say amen. 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 Well, why would I even dare? Because I want to. Who got those 12 baskets? I don't have a clue. All my life, I've heard it said one basket per disciple. That's what I've heard my whole life, right or wrong. Doesn't say it, so people are just surmising, yes or no. So when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm not preaching some, this is what you got to believe to go to heaven. Amen? Do you understand that? Say amen. i got to clarify it. But I believe it with every fiber of my being. And I'm going to keep preaching it until I can't preach it anymore. You know who I believe got those baskets? I believe the little boy did. Because he gave his lunch to Jesus. Jesus took the little boy's lunch, blessed it, multiplied it, fed a multitude. Give and it shall be given unto you. And can you see the little boy? I, I, preacher, what if you're wrong? Well, what if I am wrong? What if I am wrong? What if you're wrong? I don't know where the disciples would have put a basket because they got in a boat and had to go to the other side. So I don't know how they'd have loaded 12 big old baskets, which were big enough to hold a human being, by the way, when you study that word for baskets. So I don't know how they'd have put those 12 baskets in that boat. I don't know, and I don't know how the little boy would have got it home. I don't know. Maybe just when we get to heaven, we'll already know. Amen? But can you just picture it? Please, could you for just a minute, could you just ask the Lord to give you some kind of imagination for five minutes? The little boy leaves home, and the mama packs him a lunch, puts in there some bread and some fish, and he goes, and he hears this man named Jesus teach. And all of a sudden, he hears them talking about, how are we going to feed this multitude? And he goes, well, I've got a little lunch. And Andrew says, hey, guys, this boy's got a lunch, but what's these among so many? And the little boy takes that lunch, and he gives everything he has to Jesus. My goodness, doesn't that bless you, yes or no? And he watches it in the hands of Jesus get blessed. And then he watches it being handed over to the disciples, and it begins to multiply. Do you see the little boy? Yes or no? We don't talk about the little boy. We won't talk about the disciples. What did they do? And all of a sudden, they start passing it out, and it multiplies, and it feeds 20,000 people. And when it's all over, they gather it up, and there's 12 baskets, and Jesus, maybe, said, here you go, little boy. And do you see him coming home with 12 baskets? And mama comes running out. Yes or no? Son, where'd you get that? And he starts telling her. Well, you see, I was down there by the mountain, and Jesus was teaching, and 20,000 people showed up, Mama, and they were hungry, and I gave Jesus my lunch, and Jesus took my lunch and blessed it, and he fed 20,000. Now, watch your mouth, son. Mama, I'm telling you, that's how it happened. He fed 20,000 people with my little lunch, the disciples passed it out. They ate all they wanted. They were satisfied. And then Jesus told them, gather it up and gave me 12 baskets. I, boy, if you tell one more lie, I'm going to spank you and I'm going to wear you out, Mama. I promise you that's exactly how it happened. Is that how it happened? I don't know. But what I do know is this, give and it shall be given to you. That's what I do know. And what I do know is this, if you take the little that you have and you put it in his hands, it'll go a whole lot further and do a whole lot more in his hands than and it will in your hands. And if you'll take what's in your hands and give it to him, not only will he take it and do more with it than you can do, he'll bless others and he'll give back to you more than you even started with to the glory of God. Boy, that's a good message on giving. Can I get a witness from anyone in the house? Amen? Take the little that you have, put it in the hands of a big, big God. Let him bless it, feed people, minister to people. It'll go much further than it will ever go in your hand or in your 401k or in your stocks and bonds and let him use it for his glory and honor. And there's no telling what he may turn right back around and put back in your hands and give you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's Wednesday night, so I can talk about it. I have never met a stingy gut that God has ever used to do any incredible work, ever. Period. Those that clench their fists tightly on their possessions 
and do not acknowledge that it's his and are not willing to give what they have to him will always go through their life limited in how they'll be used by God. And what I'm not telling you is give and you'll get a new Mercedes. What I am telling you is take what you have and give it to him and just sit back and watch what he does with it to meet the needs of others and to bless you to his glory. Amen? Amen? My goodness gracious. Makes me want to preach a message on tithing right now. Amen. (laughs) God's good. Yes or no? And so I pray, watch this, I pray that somehow we'd be sensitive to the needs of others around us, the hungry, the hurting crowd. Watch this. And we'd be used of the Lord to give what we have, put it in his hands, and meet the needs of others to his glory. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And if you can, just quietly stand to your feet if you're physically able tonight. And while we just take a moment, I want us just to pray over what we've heard tonight and what we've talked about and what we've experienced this evening. And, and maybe in your life, you would just simply say to the Lord, right where you are, where you're standing, Lord, I'm just so thankful to acknowledge, Lord, that everything I have has been given to me by you. I'm so thankful to acknowledge, Lord, that you are the giver of all good gifts. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Everything I have, I have because of your grace and because you've given it to me. And tonight, if we could just collectively acknowledge that the Lord is so gracious and so good and so kind and so faithful. Father, help us during this time of the year, this season, not to look at the multitude and to always be so cynical, to question their motives, to doubt, to look down our nose and to say they're not worthy of your grace and of your mercy. But help us, Father, to see them through your eyes and to understand, Father, that we are included in that number of this multitude. The many times that we've pursued you, the many times that we've come after you with impure motives, with impure thoughts, with impure desires, wanting things from you only for our own advantage and our own, our own good. And yet, Lord, you've been so faithful to us. And for that, we just say thank you and we honor you and we worship you and we adore you. You're so good to us. You're so kind to us. And tonight, may we just pray to the Lord for wisdom to be sensitive to take what we have and to put it in his hands and to know that it's not just cliche, it's true. Little is much when God is in it. And when we take the little that we have, as we look at the great multitude and the great need, we think to ourselves, what's the use? This little will make no difference. But yet when we're just faithful to give the little that we have to God and put it in his hands, I'm telling you, he can do so much more with it in his hands than in ours. And so, Father, teach us tonight to practice true stewardship of our resources, of our talents, of our finances, of every area of our life, to put it in your hands and to trust you to do so much more with it than we could to take it, to multiply it, to bless it, to minister to the needs of others, and to do so with a heart that says, Lord, have your way. Father, it is a privilege to know you and to serve you and to honor you, and especially during these holidays, help us to be faithful as you take the gospel and put it in our hands to go and to distribute it, knowing that it will never run out. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. And there's enough power in the blood to save anyone, anywhere, anytime. And there's power in the gospel to reach that one that is closest to hell. And so help us, Lord, never to give up, but to always be faithful to go and to tell. We love you, we honor you, we worship you, and we thank you so much for your faithfulness tonight. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.